this was, aha, right. This was actually what I wanted to call this book. Uh, but I think it's a better title, but the editors didn't like it, so that was that. You pick your battles. So this is, uh, so it ended up being called The Slut Demon Song, for which I have a certain affection that it's difficult to pronounce. So uh, just very briefly, uh, there, are, there are three threads of my life that have fed into it. And the first is my research, going all the way back to my PhD work. Uh, these, these lemurs haven't read the textbooks and don't know how they're supposed to behave. Uh, and uh, studying rule breakers is a really good way of gaining insight into the rules. Uh, now, if you look at these three animals, the one at the bottom uh, looks smaller. Actually, he isn't. He's just crouching. Uh, the two females up above him are socially dominant to him, and that means they get to feed uh, in preferred places before he does. And if he had the temerity to try and move up and nudge one of them out of the way, he would get snapped and he would get beaten up, and, uh, and he would then sort of cringe and disappear. So, you know, that is in our other non-human primate relatives in uh, monkeys and apes uh, and other prosimians. Males are generally larger than and socially dominant to females. I will leave it to you to decide uh, how to kind of put that together for our own species. But, uh, um, but, but, but these critters are, don't obey the rules. And so that has been a piece of my research. I have now actually gone on to, uh, to think about other features of these animals that are uh, idiosyncratic and, and distinctive uh, in their behavior, their life histories, their ecology. So, so there is that piece to it, whoops. But there is um, the second thread uh, is that, uh, you know, I was doing my PhD work in 1970. And uh, even then, 50 years ago, there were clearly environmental challenges in Madagascar. Uh, one saw forests disappearing. Uh, uh, these animals' future seemed to be threatened. And it didn't seem to me that you could simply do research. You had to get involved, roll your sleeves up. And so from 1974 on, uh, with colleagues from the University of Antananarivo in Madagascar, uh, we established a, a partnership with a community in southwest Madagascar, uh, a group of villagers uh, who had an interest in saving their forests for quite different reasons for our, for our reasons. Uh, they wanted to save the forests because their ancestors were buried there, because it was a source of food and wood and medicines, and because it was a great place to hide cattle when the cattle rustlers were in the neighborhood. Uh, that effort has gone on for, well, since 1975 and, and, and grown and grown in scale. And we've actually come together now with a shared set of values that encompass all of the reasons that we care about the forest. So that's the second thread. And then, as, uh, as many of you will know, the third thread uh, got on the way in 19, uh, not long after I came to Yale. Uh, and I met this uh, uh, archaeologist who was just finishing his PhD uh, on the origins of agriculture in uh, Taiwan. Um, but it turned out that the conditions of preservation in Taiwan for organic material are not very good. And at that stage, you couldn't work in mainland China if you were an American archaeologist. And I rather fancied him. So I started saying things like, well, you know, Madagascar has really good preservation. And it has a really interesting uh, and very little known prehistory of human settlement and transformation of the landscape. How about Madagascar? Well, the upshot was uh, 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 a, a, a new archaeologist for Madagascar and a marriage. Uh, and in fact, uh, Bob's work opened my eyes up in space and time and the questions that I asked. And we were, in fact, going to write a book together. But you don't get to choose the plan. 
uh, and so we all met up in Madagascar this summer, and uh, anyway, and you just kind of say, well, you know, it's just wonderful, all these people who have kind of appeared or reappeared in my life through James. Anyway, Ken Barron's photos, I think, uh, are, are truly splendid. So there's the bird. Okay, so done with the, the quick, uh, the one sailor lightly, of the living biodiversity. Now plunge back 67 million years, okay? This is Bimsi Bofo um, Pinga, uh, known by its discoverer David Krauss as the frog from hell, uh, or uh, the hopping head. The scale, that is uh, uh, a, 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 your average living frog. Um, these critters were found alongside seven species of dinosaurs, a multitude of snakes, I mean, this is fossil remains, seven species of dinosaurs, experiments in birdiness, though no ancestors, uh, nothing ancestral to any living bird, um, matching uh, this guilty uh, boot uh, which probably preyed on small dinosaurs, it should be said. But matching Bielsi Bufo in weirdness is, uh, was a vegetarian crocodile. I mean, Dr. Seuss couldn't make it up. It was just kind of this great world that was out there. And then, as you all know, 66 million years ago, uh, an asteroid hit the Earth. 75% of the land mammals on the Earth uh, disappeared. And as far as we know, only two creatures made it across that boundary in Madagascar. Uh, one is a blind snake, and the other is an, iguan the an ancestor of the iguanids alive today. But uh, nothing else that we see in, on the island alive today has an ancestry that traces back uh, beyond uh, the asteroid, at the moment of the asteroid's impact. Um, with, with a few question marks. There were a few question marks, but it was, it was pretty much a total wipeout. Now, at this, I should say at this point that uh, one of the uh, frustrating and uh, curious idiosyncrasies of Madagascar is that although the fossil record is quite good until 66 billion years ago, for the last 66 billion years, for the cemetery, uh, there are no fossil-bearing, uh, de exposed, stratigraphic uh, deposits uh, anywhere on the island. There is no fossil record. The oldest bones from the recent part are bones. They're sub-fossils. They're not completely fossilized. And they mostly date to 10 to 25,000 years ago. So during the period of time when Madagascar went from empty, effectively, to a being a hotspot of biodiversity, you've got no fossil record to guide you as to what happens. So the way that it is done is by reverse engineering using uh, molecular wizardry uh, and to some degree more comparative morphology, but it's basically molecular clocks that are enabling one to say that uh, the ancestors of uh, the animals we see there today do not uh, pre predate the KT boundary. So, so, so here you are. Okay. So ignore. I mean, this is kind of. It, it, I think it's great. You know, Madagascar wasn't always an island. It was part of Gondwana. It was over the South Pole for a while, and it's just sort of wandering around the globe. But anyway, the, at the, by the time that we're interested in, which is somewhere between these two, okay, this is 88 million years ago, this is 60 million years ago, but the important thing here is that uh, by the time of uh, the asteroid impact, Madagascar was very much an island surrounded by uh, deep seas, deep water. So it's isolated. Uh, so, you know, so what happened? How do, how do you get there? Well, for birds, uh, also for bats, uh, you can fly there. Um, it, 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 it is curious, uh, it's for the ornithologists, it's actually sort of interesting and curious that there are several bird families from Africa that you would expect to see in Madagascar, woodpeckers, honeybirds, hornbills. 
Uh, they don't see it like Asper. That's another, you know, and I think there are other filters, but that's another uh, a story for another day. But if you can't fly, well, then your options are to uh, float uh, or to swim uh, or do something else. Now, most land mammals uh, can't float uh, or swim, uh, and certainly not 400 kilometers or so uh, across the Mozambique Channel, which is what it would take. Uh, so, so what do you do? You come across on a mat of vegetation, is what you do. The notion that animals can cross the large distances on vegetation map uh, has been uh, quite contentious over the years. Living as I do on the banks of the Connecticut River and watching what floats down that quite demure river, uh, it has always seemed perfectly reasonable to me to imagine that this might happen on a larger scale. Uh, I, you know, so what I found for you, it, 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 this is a video, it's one minute, and uh, I decided, you know, I will stop it out for a minute, but I think this is just completely amazing, uh, and it, 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 it's, it's Panama, but it gives you an idea of what was possible. Look at this. You have to wait for the best part. <laughs> Coming up shortly. Isn't that extraordinary? <laughs> and the punchline, of course, is, but there were no bridges uh, 60 million years ago, uh, which would have been helpful. But so, 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 the, 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 the supposition is that uh, these great mats of vegetation uh, floated out of the mouth of the Zambezi River, which lets out, gives out into the Mozambique Channel and that uh, animals aboard those vegetation rafts would have made it uh, across the Mozambique Channel. And that was how uh, Madagascar was resettled by land animals. But you know, it's 400 kilometers. Uh, based on modern estimates of what the, the speed of currents would likely have been, and these are kind of ballpark figures, but it's about a month aboard a vegetation man uh, out at sea. Uh, and uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenging proposition. And, and going back to the living biota, uh, it's, it's a different kind of challenge for different kinds of animals. And I wanted to talk a bit about that because it helps to explain the oddness of the configuration of Madagascar's fauna. So starting first with uh, amphibians. For amphibians, it would have been uh, hardest of all, perhaps, because their skin is extremely permeable. And so uh, salt water, any contact with salt water, uh, dehydrates uh, an amphibian uh, almost immediately. And so, and, and you have to remember, it can't just be uh, 
it, it, it's either got to be a, a thin number of other eggs, or in the case of, uh, of, of, of mammals, you need at least, uh, well, a pregnant female or, or a handful. So there's, you know, you, you've got to have a founding population that is, that is viable. So, uh, so, so I think one can say in kind of the order of magnitude of the challenge, it was the, the greatest challenge was to make for the amphibians. And it is perhaps uh, a consequence of that, that in fact, the, there are only, the only amphibians on the island, the only ones that made it are frogs. And with one founding ancestor, according to the molecular evidence, frogs made it once, or at least frogs that survived, his, his descendants survived to the present, made it across only once. <coughs> Except for Pitidina uh, mascariensis, uh, who arrived uh, recently enough that it was thought that maybe humans had brought this little frog, but it's quite widespread in Madagascar now, but it's actually older than any human presence. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the exception that proves the rule. So how did it get there? Probably on a vegetation map, probably when cyclones, uh, a cyclone moved the currents on the island uh, with the, the Mozambique Channel currents and blew this little frog across. But, but, in, but you know, in general, you get, there's one, there's one uh, amphibian ancestor, the ancestor of, of this critter. Turning to uh, uh, the reptiles, um, you know, if you, if you, the world over, if you want to uh, point to the uh, sort of the seafaring champions of the world, uh, it would be lizards. Uh, they don't have porous uh, skins, and of course they can lower their metabolism uh, so that their energy costs are vanishingly small. So sort of sitting it out on a vegetation map, map for, uh, for reptiles uh, would be, and, and, and perhaps particularly for lizards, uh, would be uh, would be comparatively speaking a picnic, and uh, and there is a great diversity of lizards. And in fact, uh, they didn't just come to Madagascar and stay there. They left Madagascar and went sort of voyaging off to other islands in the, uh, the West Indian Ocean, and then they came voyaging back to Madagascar, and then they went voyaging back to Africa again. They got around these these these, these lizards, which makes uh, molecular uh, the, sort of the molecular analysis of who you know who was where uh, when extremely complicated, and the story of the movements of these creatures uh, has yet uh, to be uh, entirely told. I, I was talking about this informally with colleagues uh, at the University of Connecticut, and some of you in this audience may be able to sort of comment more on this. Uh, and they were saying that another way, not coming over only on maps, uh, but just their eggs floating over, there was some thought that the eggs of both uh, amphibians and reptiles, but reptiles in particular, might be able to make it across the ocean just as floating eggs. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know, but I think, you know, having seen the size of these vegetation mats, you don't need floating eggs. You can do it on those on those rafts. Uh, so then, turning thirdly to uh, 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 the, the mammals. Um, Four groups of mammals uh, made it across. Uh, earliest were the primates uh, between 60 and 50 million years ago. These are molecular clock based estimates. Then the Tenrekidae, these little insectivorous creatures. Uh, and then uh, the carnivore ancestor and the rodent ancestor. Uh, in each case, uh, the molecular evidence says that there was one founding ancestor, one cluster. The, all, of the, all of the living biodiversity has diversified from a single event. Um, and I would, sort of, there's, a, there's a number of, of, of comments to make about this. Um, you know, the first is, you know, so the Lemuridium arrived between 60 and 50 million years ago. Yes, uh, and also no. 
They arrived some day or night, wet and exhausted and bedraggled, and climbed up the beach. Uh, it's very difficult to keep ecological time, real time, for what this must have been like for these creatures with these kind of million of years estimates, which is the best that we can do with the molecular evidence. So that is, uh, is, is, is one point that, uh, that, I, that I want to make. Uh, the second is, um, uh, this was done by Lucy Betty Nash. Some of you may know she's an artist uh, at Stony Brook, uh, uh, married to Stephen Nash. She has a hippopotamus <laughs> with one foot in the water up at the top left-hand side. Um, hippos did actually make it to Madagascar. They made it uh, quite recently, a few million years ago. And there, are, there were, until 500 years ago, two or possibly three species of hippos. That's not all that appeared. There was a kidney hippo. And then there was one larger hippo with a lot of uh, sexual dimorphism, or possibly two species. Um, it, hippos don't swim, um, uh, and I don't, maybe they float, but they don't float 400 miles. I, I assume that hippos would swim it, but not so. They dance across the bottom of great falls and rivers, but they don't actually swim. So the hippos must have come over on that. And that is really, I mean, apart from the fact that it kind of boggles the mind to think of hippos on a vegetation map making it all these distance. But there's another reason that it boggles the mind as well, because you will see these dates are all between 60 and 20 million years ago. Uh, there's a reason that there's nothing after that, or only hippos and not much else. And that is because uh, until 20 million years ago, the current that flows across the Indian Ocean would hit the coast of Africa and then bounce back to the western coast of Madagascar, because Madagascar was south of where it is today. So uh, there was a current from Africa to Madagascar uh, kind of like an umbilical cord connecting the island to mainland Africa. But by 20 million years ago, Madagascar had moved far enough north that instead of this current hitting the African coast and back and bouncing back, it was now hitting the east coast of Madagascar, flowing around the island and down the Mozambique Channel. And the umbilical cord was cut. What was already uh, an, an improbable uh, uh, sweet states crossing became well nigh impossible. And uh, when it did happen, the thought is that what must have happened in the case of the hippo and that little frog is that a cyclone sort of turned the currents around, which can happen, and the currents very briefly uh, flowed uh, uh, eastward instead of westward. Um, but so, so, uh, Back to the, uh, how am I doing on the oh, I should move along. Um, so, 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 you know, we've talked about the amphibians that had a real problem because of their skin. We talked about the reptiles, uh, and they were, they did great, uh, because they could essentially go into an almost dead state. Uh, but mammals, the mammals, you know, what do mammals do? Mammals have high metabolic rates, and they need regular food and water uh, because they, uh, they, 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 they regulate their metabolism and don't sort of lower it and raise it. They're homeostatic uh, creatures. Um, so how did they do it? Well, it turns out that uh, in, among all of these uh, mammals that we see in Madagascar today, there is at least one species, and often more, who is actually capable of lowering its metabolic rate. Uh, and the, the hypothesis now is that that is actually a, an ancient state, an ancient capacity, that in some species has persisted to the present, and that, in effect, 
what the ancestors of the mammals that we see uh, uh, alive in Madagascar today, that those ancestors snoozed their way across the Mozambique <laughs> Channel, that they just went into kind of shut them uh, and just snuggled their way across. There, there, there is, in fact, there's a, there's a nocturnal uh, linear Paragallius, uh, the dwarf cleaner, and it actually is, is such a, it's, it's so sweet. It, it, it buries itself in leaves in the ground and goes to sleep uh, for months at a time in the dry season. And then it buries its way out and, and comes back out again. And this is not a very primate thing to do, uh, but, but they do. Um, now, sort of connecting as a final sort of point all of this to my own research, when I started um, uh, doing my PhD work, the animals that I was working with were not habituated. Uh, they weren't used to my presence. And so uh, if I got anywhere near them uh, for a while, they would just kind of, they would, they would sort of, you know, give alarm calls and kind of flap around and show their displeasure and run away, leaping away through the treetops with me, running and running along behind them. Except, except on cold mornings down in the south, the south has a desert forest, and I would be out there uh, waiting for the animals to wake up. And it was really cold on the forest floor. Uh, and I, you know, these animals are not habituated, and I'm sort of all ready to kind of run after them when they take off. But these unhabituated animals would wake up when the sun hit the tops of the trees, and they would climb up into the treetops uh, in the sunshine and sunbathe, uh, which this animal is doing. And they would just sit in the sunshine. They have black skin. It doesn't, doesn't show up very well here. They have black skin and, in fact, not much fur usually on their stomachs. So their stomachs are real sort of heat absorbing, sort of, uh, they, they, they serve a heat absorbing function. And on mornings where um, there were clouds in the sky, when the, when the sun went behind the cloud, this group of eight animals that are sitting doing this in the treetops uh, were going to cover back up again, which is why sort of the, you know, in, the, in, in, in that community, these animals are seen as animals that worship the sun. It's a very reasonable conclusion to draw, and in some sense, they do. Uh, but anyway, for me on the ground, as I watch these animals freezing myself while they're kind of sunbathing up in the top of the trees, there was also this question of, but they're not running away. Have they, you know, they could see me, they knew I was there. Uh, what on earth was going on? Um, but what was going on was that they were warming up. Uh, they, you know, that's what I know. I don't, I, I can't prove that. So I'm very, well, working to be able to prove this. I'm very sure now that they had dropped their internal body temperature overnight to save energy. And they were up in the treetops warming up. Because after about 40 minutes of doing this, it was then kind of, okay, now we're ready to start the day. And at that point, they started alarm calling and threatening me and looking down at me, and then ran off through the forest. But it was a clear 40 minutes when they saw exactly that I was there but they just, as it were, weren't yet ready to run. So uh, I tell you that as a kind of final comment, uh, because if there is something, one thing that I have learned uh, over the course of, of, and I've learned many things, many things about many things over the course of writing this book, it is that uh, the present and the past are inextricably bound in ways that uh, uh, are self-evident sometimes, and sometimes not self-evident at all. And that uh, if we are to think about the present and indeed the future, an understanding of the past is, uh, is, is, is helpful, I would say, absolutely essential, which of course, you know, in some measure brings me back to exactly where I started, which is with the, the importance and centrality of the Peabody in this whole enterprise of the world in which we live. So I, 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 so now, 
I, I, I've never read from any book before, except to grandchildren and children, but I'm going to read to you because I'm told that that's what one does. So this is, uh, uh, um, here we go, okay. So uh, it, it, I, I, I timed it, and it's less than five minutes, just in case you're wondering. So okay, a drama in the forest of Ampizza way back in 1970, first made me wonder how and when ancestors of the animals living in Madagascar today arrived. Time was going by slowly that day. I remember that really well when it was. Uh, and I was ready for a lunch break of cold rice and sardines in the shade of a tree. But one seafucker was still munching away on a fistful of leaves when the rest of her group moved out of sight. And I wanted to keep an eye on her until she rejoined the others and settled down for a midday siesta. She ate, and I sat hungrily, until a sudden explosion of alarm calls banished all thoughts of food from both our minds. She leapt off through the trees, and I hurried in her wake. The scene we came upon was disconcerting. The other members of her group were arrayed in a circle, staring silently. The object of their fascination was a boa snake in a tree with a bulging-eyed mouse screamer slowly disappearing feet first down its throat. My first thought was, why don't they do something? Should I do something? Follow quickly, it's not easy. This is not the only context I've seen this in. It's not easy to witness nature red, nature red in tooth and claw without interfering. I doubt the seafucker shared my existential dilemma, but the event was clearly a matter of interest to them, and we all kept watching until the mouse swimmer vanished from sight and reappeared as a lump in the boa's sleek body. The episode made the day exciting in a gruesome kind of way. My research usually involved watching lemurs do nothing at great length, and idle thoughts would often float through my mind at those times. But that day set me wondering if there were lemurs in Madagascar before it became an island, and about the arrival time of animals that considered lemurs a potential lunch. Did that boa's ancestors live in Madagascar before lemurs were around? Or were the lemurs horribly shocked when boas appeared on the scene? I have no answer to this question then, and in fact, little evidence bearing on them existed at the time. And then moving to the end of the sort of, and so what happens, what have we learned after? The past weaves its way into the present, and the present does not stand still. The parade of animals goes on, largely orchestrated by our own species for the last few thousand years. People have transported many new species to Madagascar on purpose or by accident. Their introduction has brought new diseases and forms of competition to endemic species, threatening their survival and perhaps contributing to recent extinctions. I return to this in, later chapter, in a later chapter after people enter this picture. The history of Madagascar's wildlife is a saga of change and innovation, from cannibal dinosaurs to paddling tenrex. It is also a saga of connection and isolation. When reptiles dominated the world, they dominated Madagascar too. When an asteroid devastated the world, Madagascar was not immune. As mammals gained their ascendant place in the world, so they did in Madagascar. Contrasting with this connectedness, Madagascar's wildlife also had character of its own from the very earliest days. Today, it is overwhelmingly the outcome of chance arrivals. Some animals did not survive, but those that did evolved into an extraordinary array of forms and lifestyles. 
It is as if the survivors improvised as they went along. Let us take a look at when, how, and why that improvisation happens. If you want to take a look, you have to read the book. <laughs> also, also to find out the, the, the truth about the Bala uh, uh, Lima uh, sort of question. I, I'll tell you that. But the truth is that the Boas are one of the groups, one of the few groups, where if the, the molecular evidence is not well resolved and it's unclear whether they were there waiting for poor hungry lemurs struggling up the beach or whether they came in as a kind of nightmare appearance later in the lemur operation. It, it, will be, it will be found out. Eventually, fossil deposits, somebody's going to find fossil deposits somewhere at some point, and people are looking and looking hard. Um, but, you know, time will tell. So anyway, so that's, uh, that's it. I would very be, I'm very happy to, uh, to take questions. I should tell you that um, uh, even with hearing aids, I'm deaf, and, uh, and, and an auditorium is not a good place to hear questions and, uh, and masks at a level of complexity. So but, but ask questions. And David will, if I can't hear them, David will interpret them. If you have longer comments and things you'd like to say, I don't want to miss them either. But please come and talk afterwards. I'm happy to stay behind afterwards. But uh, that, so, so that's the, the, the caveat in all, in all of this. So anyway, so thank you. And so.